Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for having me here. Um, I'm from British Columbia, and this is actually the first time I've traveled east of Montreal. Uh, it's, a, it's a really lovely country. I travel and I talk a lot about open source to audiences all around the world. Uh, but there's a, there's a phrase I've been wanting to use in a speech for a long time, and I've never found the right audience for it. However, I think today might be the day. So let me give it a try. Vive le logiciel! <laughs> Vive le logiciel libre! <laughs> Anyhow, um, I have a problem which I'd like to share with you. And uh, it's not an uncommon problem. It's probably one many of you share. My problem is I have a mother-in-law. And when we sit down to Christmas dinner, which is coming up in a few months, uh, she has this question which she asks. And it's a perfectly reasonable question for a mother-in-law to ask a son-in-law. She asks me, what is it that I do? What do I do? The subtext being, am I doing something that can be rationally expected to help support her perfect daughter and two darling grandchildren? And this is where things get difficult, because what I do is I sit in my office at the back of the house, and I work on software that people are encouraged to download and deploy and use for free. For free. She understands the programming part of it well enough, um, at least insofar as I sit in front of my computer and I type things on it. But the for free part causes some serious discomfort. Because how do the perfect daughter and two darling grandchildren get supported for free? Am I crazy, perhaps? Am I some kind of utopian hippie? Maybe not good son-in-law material. The proximate answer, and on a good night this will cool her off, is that I'm employed by a company, OpenGeo, that pays me to work on this software that we give away for free. Voila! But it doesn't take much for her to see past that dodge, and by the second glass of wine, she'll come round again. So who pays OpenGeo for this free software? Who indeed? In the competitive marketplace, full of beasts like Oracle and Apple and Microsoft, that picture of Steve Ballmer really <laughs> freaks me out, how can something as warm and fluffy and cuddly as an open source software company survive? What is it exactly that we are selling? If you want to understand what open source companies are selling, it helps to understand what the existing proprietary vendors are selling. And here's the surprising part. They aren't selling software. They're selling products. Let me explain what I mean by that. In the business classic, Crossing the Chasm, which I highly recommend, Jeffrey Moore says that in the technology adoption life cycle, which is traditionally understood as a smooth passage from the small early markets of visionaries and early adopters to the large mainstream market of pragmatists and conservatives, there is a little understood gap. In fact, a huge chasm between the small early markets and the big mainstream markets. And this chasm is there because the personalities of the customers in the early market are very different from the personalities of the customers in the mainstream market. Early adopters and visionaries have a high tolerance for risk. They like to learn things themselves, and they don't need a lot of support. Here's an early adopter with the iPhone he bought on the very first day they were available. The mainstream customers are exactly the opposite. In order to prosper, growing software companies must cross the market chasm to gain access to the big mainstream markets. And to do so, Moore says they must transition from selling software into selling what he calls a whole product. Now, a young, naive technology company might say, but, but we have a product. It's on this CD-ROM right here. But they don't have a product. They have software. What they have is salable in the early markets, but not to the majority market. The whole product has software at its core, but it adds in a critical layer of extra services and infrastructure around the outside 
things that reduce the risk or the perceived risk associated with adopting the product. Training courses, support infrastructure, resellers and consulting networks, update mechanisms, and so on. And it's the combination of the software with the added layer of valuable extras that make a compelling whole product. Only a whole product can move from the adventurous early adopter market to the risk-averse mainstream market. For example, as a piece of database software, Oracle is not all that compelling. It's kind of bulky, it's very hard to learn, and it's pretty easy to screw it up. But if you add in a 300-pound shelf of professionally written documentation, training to build a population of developers and administrators, a rich ecosystem of third-party tools, a reputable, if mercenary, company providing support, an evil genius, <laughs> deep integration with other elements of the Oracle software portfolio, and you have a very compelling whole product. Now, here's the odd thing. Even though it's very easy to see that the whole product offers tremendous value beyond the software itself, our mental model of technology acquisition is still one where we pay money for the software and the vendor throws in the rest of the whole product for free. All that great extra value for free. And this is where our cognitive dissonance about open source software comes from. Because what happens to our mental model when the cost of the software goes to zero? No company can give away the software for free and also provide the rest of the whole product for free. Something has to give. Now for the early adopters and technology visionaries, the people in the early market, and this audience is full of you people, there's no problem. They just use the software as is and take advantage of the thinner layer of support provided for free by the open source community. They don't need the whole product, and they probably never will. But what about the huge early majority and late majority? What will it take to get them to, op to adopt open source software? The low price of the software alone is not sufficient to seal the deal because the rest of the whole product is missing. So the long-term open source business model, as a general proposition, is about providing the whole product suitable for mainstream customers, but changing the point of monetization. Instead of companies selling software and cross-subsidizing access to a free network of services, we'll have companies selling access to a network of services and cross-subsidizing the development of free software. This is precisely the Red Hat Linux model. Say you've got some open source software being developed on the internet. You've got Red Hat, and you've got a risk-averse mainstream customer. He gives Red Hat money for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Red Hat uses that money to build the whole product and to fund open source software development. They take a copy of the raw software, wrap it in value-added services, and give it to the customer as a whole product. The customer could simply download the software directly, but then he wouldn't get support, automatic upgrades, testing, and so on. And for a mainstream customer, that feels like a risky situation to be in. That's how the open source model is supposed to work in an ideal situation. However, it's not like the old proprietary model is fading away. Microsoft is a $223 billion company. Oracle is a $103 billion company. SAP is a $58 billion company. The biggest open source vendor, Red Hat is only a $5 billion company. So maybe being an open source software developer isn't such a good career choice. Maybe I should be worried. Maybe I should be polishing my resume. Both open source and open source companies sound like helpless, fluffy, cuddly bunnies. Fun to play with, but way overmatched in the marketplace. Why is it that I remain so confident? I'm confident because there's more to this story than just the market for shrink wrap software. And there's a lot more to the fluffy bunny than meets the eye. The fluffy bunny is busy transforming the field of information technology in profound ways and leaving carnage in its wake. For example, uh, The Economist magazine, arbiter of free market orthodoxy, has already taken in the situation and declared open source a serious player. They say, open source has won the argument. 
it is now generally accepted that the future will involve a blend of both proprietary and open source software. So how can this be? How can the leading open source company have a market capitalization less than 3% of the leading proprietary company when it, <laughs> and then how can open source win the argument when it's so manifestly overmatched? Here's how. First, understand that you can't comprehend the success of open source exclusively by looking at the marketplace. In the marketplace, the unit of competition is a company, and the measure of success is profit. The more dollars you take in, the more successful you are. If you take in too few dollars, you go extinct. Lots of people have noticed that there's parallels between the market and the field of evolutionary biology. Like taken to an extreme, you get theories like social Darwinism. But for our case, the metaphor is instructive. Only the strong survive. Those companies, organisms, that best adapt to their markets, their environments, take in the most money, food or energy, and those that do not go extinct. They end up bankrupt. Also, as with evolutionary biology, it's easy to be distracted by the big lumbering beasts that appear to be directly engaged in competition. And that's a bad thing, because the really important competition is not at the level of the organism, but at a lower level, much farther down in the realm of the gene. Now, the competition between genes is described by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, an exploration of how simple, selfish reproductive behavior at the level of genes can lead to apparently altruistic behaviors at the level of the organism. In Dawkins' formulation, behaviors that maximize the chances of genetic survival are passed to future generations, even when those behaviors endanger the survival of a particular individual. So for example, here's a behavior that makes no sense in an individual-centric model of evolution. This is a, a killdeer on Vancouver Island engaging in a distraction display. The parent bird puts on an elaborate and completely fake display of being injured to draw an approaching predator, or in this case an approaching videographer, away from its young. The parent organism is placing itself at great risk. Why? Because the strategy is a good way to preserve the genetic heritage of the children in the nest. The competition is at the genetic level. So the selfish gene came out in 1976. And in the opening pages, Dawkins has this to say about some of his contemporaries. And you can see right away where he gets his reputation as a gentle and self-effacing man. <clears throat> the trouble with these other books is that their authors got it totally and utterly wrong. They got it wrong because they understood how, uh, misunderstood how evolution works. They made the erroneous assumption that the important thing in evolution is the good of the species or the group rather than the good of the individual or the gene. The same criticism applies to people who attempt to understand the success of open source strictly through an analysis of the marketplace. They misunderstand how software lives and dies, confusing the host with what it carries. Because the unit of competition in the world of software is not the corporation. It's the program. It's software. It's source code. In the biosphere, organisms feed on other organisms who feed on plants, who feed on light from Mr. Sun. So in the, competition, so in the end, the competition is for sources of energy, either direct in the form of sunlight or indirect in the bodies of plants and other animals. In the cybersphere, programs also compete for resources. The resource that programs compete for is developer time, commonly known as human attention. So programs feed on developers, who in turn feed on caffeinated beverages and try to stay away from Mr. Sun. <laughs> programs need programmer attention to survive. A program that is no longer being maintained and updated is a program that is dying. A program that no one has a use for is dead. First it will be abandoned, unrun, then it will become unrunnable, and then it will be deleted. Programs need programmer attention to survive. For example, when Oracle gobbles up yet another enterprise software company, do the customers bemoan the death of the company? No. Primarily they worry about the software. Will the bugs be fixed? Will we get the next release of the new features? Will the developers flee to greener pasture? 
will the owner continue to feed the software? And what does the software worry about? All that matters to the software is that it continues to receive a steady supply of developer time. Understanding the competition between proprietary and open source as a competition at the program level clears away a lot of distraction. Now we can directly evaluate which strategy is the most adaptable strategy for survival, the open source model or the proprietary model. A proprietary program can best be understood as a form of parasite. It resides in symbiosis with the host organism, the corporation that owns it, and it draws its sustenance exclusively from the developers provided by that corporation. The amount of sustenance provided to the program generally correlates with the success of the corporation selling the program, and when the corporation dies, the program usually dies too. If the corporation is subsumed by another corporation, the host may continue to feed the program, it may starve it to death, or terminate it immediately in favor of some other program. When you think about it that way, it's easy to feel a little sorry for a proprietary program. It's very much at the mercy of its host. Its success or failure may have nothing to do with its intrinsic quality. It may have only a small team of developers to love it and feed it and carry it forward. In contrast to the sheltered monastic existence of proprietary software, the lifestyle of a successful open source program is incredibly promiscuous. Any developer with a nice smile and a good patch is welcome to join the party. Open source programs can draw sustenance in the form of long-term stable commitments from corporations who sell services and products around the software, from, develop, from devoted contractors who derive income from contracts for features development or bug fixes, or from quick relationships with casual developers who just drop off a patch and run away. In contrast, proprietary programs are embedded within the institutional framework of a corporation. So it's much harder for them to form relationships with new sources of development. People can't just stroll in the door and add a new feature to Microsoft Word. The relationship between the developer and a proprietary, and proprietary software is formal, contractual, and exclusive. Open source programs can form relationships with multiple developers and multiple organizations simultaneously because open source is not trapped inside a single organization. The rules of participation are cultural, not contractual, and broad community participation is the whole point. Take the most successful open source example, Linux. The Linux software has gone from drawing development effort from a single Finnish graduate student to receiving the attentions of hundreds of fully funded developers in multiple Fortune 500 co corporations, government agencies, and academic institutions. Even organizations that are in direct market competition IBM and Oracle, Red Hat and Novell provide code for Linux, as do thousands of other developers with institutional affiliations ranging from top secret government agencies to academia to individual developers whose only real affiliation is to their cat and their coffee vendor. In fact, kernel developer Greg Cole Hartman did a study of the Linux kernel source code in 2008 and found that the number one developer affiliation was unaffiliated, accounting for 17% of the kernel. Red Hat was number two at 11%. The example of Linux shows that open source programs are not limited to feeding off pure open source companies. They can feed off any company that derives competitive advantage from using open source. One of the most perceptive commentators and observers on the, on the uh, entrance of open source ideas in the marketplace is Matt Assay, and he recently wrote we are all open source companies now, which means that none of us are. What he means is that every company in the marketplace is now deriving competitive, competitive advantage from open source in one way or another, even deeply, deeply proprietary companies. IBM was once so proprietary that Microsoft looked open by comparison. But in 2000, IBM was the first major company to adopt a Linux strategy, they invest directly in the Linux kernel development to ensure it runs on their CPUs and systems. They are a founder of the Eclipse Java framework project and a number, and they build a number of their proprietary products, like Rational Rose, on top of the Eclipse libraries. Oracle has purchased several open source companies over the last few years, database companies like InnoBase and SleepyCat, 
And last year they bought Sun, which netted them some very well-known open source names. And they aren't just sitting on them. At Oracle Open World last week, or last year, uh, Oracle's evil genius promised to invest even more money in MySQL R&D than Sun is currently spending. Even Microsoft, which practically invented the idea of proprietary shrink wrap software back in the 70s, now has an active open source strategy. They have an open source community, CodePlex. They're a sponsor of the Apache Foundation. They invest in the development of Windows compatible open source like Iron Python and now even PHP. They have even contributed patches to the Linux kernel under the GNU GPL. In our industry too, the momentum is more and more towards open source use. ESRI uses the Google raster library and Arc Explorer, so does Google Earth. PostGIS is becoming an industry standard spatial database supported even by old guard companies like ESRI and MapInfo. When even the proprietary companies are investing in open source, what does it mean to be an open source company? Everybody is doing it. People like to talk about the change from proprietary to open source as an open source revolution. But revolutions are quick, turbulent affairs. Is it a revolution if it takes 25 years? I think what we're experiencing is not an open source revolution. It's an open source evolution. The progress is slow and incremental, but the movement is always in the same direction, month by month and year by year. We're just at the start of a transformation in the software market, where purchasers recognize that they have the option to buy the whole product and get the software for free. And we're in the middle of a transformation of how we build software, moving very quickly from a closed corporate model, where source code is private, to an open collaborative model, where source code is a commons. And it's the combination of these two trends that fills me with confidence, because the two trends are reinforcing each other. And that's why I can look my mother-in-law in the eye and say, don't worry, it'll all work out. I'm on the side of history, on the ground floor of a growing market, riding a wave that's just picking up. And so are all of you. Let's make the most of it. Thank you very much.